We know, of course, that there are viruses with RNA genomes and viruses with DNA genomes. Today, I want to tell you about how we make RNA, both mRNA and new genomes in infected cells. And I'm going to start with a little overview of the enzymology of RNA synthesis. And then I want to go into an example of each of the major classes of RNA viruses, how they make mRNA, and how they make more genomes. Is this, is this too annoying, this reverb? Are you OK? It's fine? OK, thank you. All right, just to put this in perspective, don't have to write anything of this down, just so you know in the scheme of the world when RNA came into being, the, the tobacco mosaic virus, 1935, was crystallized. Now, this was, of course, the first virus that was discovered, so this plays a big role in virology. 1936, it was shown that these crystals have RNA in them, 5% RNA, but no one knew what it did. In 1945, it was found that DNA is genetic material in bacteria. And the Hershey Chase experiment, which we've talked about, showed that DNA in phages is genetic material. It wasn't uh, 1953, the structure of DNA. So here's how, you know, you don't need to remember this for this course, but the structure of DNA is the year I was born. <laughs> so if you ever need to remember it from another course, and that is why I'm a scientist, of course, because of that year. 1956, uh, the RNA of tobacco mosaic virus was shown to be infectious. That is, they pulled the RNA out of the virus, and put it in a cell by transfection, and virus was produced. So the first demonstration that RNA is genetic material. And then in 1959, RNA was found in a lot of animal viruses, and in the 60s, people began to study how this RNA molecule was duplicated. Because in the beginning, people thought it was copied by a cell. Here's, here's the weird thing. People thought this RNA was converted to DNA in the cell, and then copied back the RNA. So they couldn't get this idea that there would be RNA copying enzymes. So here's the Baltimore scheme again, of course. Uh, and today we're going to talk about viruses that have plus-stranded RNAs that go through a negative strand intermediate. We're going to talk about negative stranded RNAs and double-stranded RNAs, these down here. And the retroviruses are in a class of their own because they copy their plus RNA into DNA. So we'll talk about those. They get a whole lecture unto themselves. Now, in the early 1960s, uh, these kinds of experiments were done to show that when viruses infect cells, they make RNA. So this is a growth curve here, hours post-infection. You remember one-step growth curve we talked about way in the beginning. So hours versus uh, here, uh, plaque-forming units per mil. This is experiment with poliovirus. And the dotted line is virus production. So remember your eclipse period, and then there's production of virus, and then the plateau. So what they did in this experiment was to infect cells, and at different times after infection, they took a sample of the cells and determined the titer of viruses by a plaque assay. At the same time, they took another sample, and they broke the cells open and added labeled triphosphates, the precursors of RNA, probably was tritium, tritium labeled. Uh, and then they incubated the extracts and then asked, is there anything large that contains radioactivity? Why I say large is because they probably precipitate the product with an acid, trichloroacetic acid, which precipitates RNAs bigger than 20 nucleotides long. So this is an assay for making a long polymer uh, in this extract of cells. So what you can see here, paralleling virus production, there is induction of some kind of activity that can make long RNAs in the extract of infected cells. So this is the first suggestion that in virus-infected cells, they induce some kind of activity uh, that can make RNA. You can see there's a very little of that activity, at, say, at zero time after infection when the virus uh, has not yet started. So this is the first kinds of evidence that is using cell extracts incubated with radioactive triphosphate. The next experiment was to do the same kind of experiment I've told you in the presence of actinomycin D. So this is a drug that inhibits uh, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase of our cells. It inhibits the production of mRNAs. And people use this because they thought that these RNA viruses were getting into the cell. They're being copied into DNA 
And then that DNA was copied into mRNA by this uh, RNA polymerase that would be inhibited by actinomycin D. But they found that these viruses induced RNA synthesis in the cytoplasm that was resistant. So that was the end of the DNA hypothesis. Although you'll see it is true for retroviruses, but for all the other RNA viruses, they're not. The next step was that uh, investigators discovered in the virions, or the virus particles of negative strand viruses, they found an RNA polymerase. So they could purify virus particles, break them open, and add uh, labeled triphosphates and see the production of RNA. So the polymerase was shown to be in the particle. Uh, then afterwards, when we got the ability to sequence viral genomes, we found that polymerases have uh, gliasp-asp, a three amino acid signature motif and then whenever someone sequenced a protein and saw a GDG, GDD, they said, ah, this must be an RNA polymerase. They could then produce the protein from recombinant DNA and show that it had the expected activity. And now today we have crystal structures of many uh, viral RNA polymerases. That is, X-ray crystallography has been used to solve their structures. So a reminder of what kind of RNA templates we're talking about here. These are viral RNA templates that need to be copied to mRNA and to be copied to more genomes. For the negative strand RNA viruses, they are coated with protein in the virion. Remember, they have to bring in an RNA polymerase with them. They, because they're negative stranded, they can't be translated. So the RNA polymerase is in the virion, and it's in the form of proteins coating uh, the RNA. So as soon as those negative strand genomes get into the cell, they can start undergoing RNA synthesis. They don't have to be translated. They can't. They're not plus-stranded. Plus-strand genomes, on the other hand, are naked. They have no protein bound to them. They're ready to be translated upon entry. Now, there are, as, as always in biology, there are always exceptions. We can make rules, but there are always exceptions. Retroviral plus-strand RNAs and coronavirus plus-strand RNAs have proteins bound to them, but they are not uh, the, well, the retrovirus, as you will see, is trans, uh, copied into DNA as soon as it gets into the cell. But the coronaviral RNA is, is a messenger RNA. So why it's coated with protein, we don't know. Those are the exceptions. For the most part, the plus strand virus genomes are naked. They get in the cell and they're translated. Double-stranded RNA, if you remember what I told you a while ago, this cannot be translated even though there's a plus strand in it because the ribosomes can't access that plus strand. So it has to be copied into mRNA in the virion. So the virions of these double-stranded RNA viruses contain an RNA polymerase. And just to rem remind you what these RNA binding proteins look like, these nucleoproteins or nucleocapsid proteins, they're called. They bind the genome of negative strand RNA. Here is uh, the, the RNA of vesicular stomatitis virus, a negative strand RNA virus. Uh, its RNA is bound by the N protein, and here's a monomer of N protein binding a small piece of RNA, and here are a couple of monomers making a multimer binding the long RNA. So the whole genome is completely coated with this N protein, as you can see here, and forms that helical nucleocapsid. So this is part of the RNA polymerase. This is not actually the uh, RNA polymerase itself, but the RNA polymerase is bound at one end. There's a single molecule bound to one end of the RNA, ready to start copying it as soon as it gets into cells. Now RNA can be naked or coated with protein. It also is, it can have unusual secondary and tertiary structures, such as those shown here. RNA can base pair and form so-called stem loops, and they can be complicated like this, have multiple branch and bulges. Um, they can form what are also called pseudonauts, so you can have a stem loop where bases in the loop can base pair with bases downstream. So it forms this kind of structure, which is called a pseudonaut. So it looks like a knot, but it isn't actually tied up into a knot. And all of these have biological function. They serve as interacting site for proteins. They have signals for RNA synthesis. So just remember, RNA is not simply a linear, linear molecule. It can fold up into very interesting and functional um, patterns. So this linear molecule up here, <laughs> I've just told you, doesn't exist. This is never linear like this. It's actually quite complicated. But we do this, of course, for clarity. Now, there are two very important goals for RNA synthesis. First, we have to copy the RNA genome 
from n to m. If you want to make more genomes, if you want to replicate the genome, you have to copy it from n to n. You can't lose any sequence. That's very important. It may seem obvious, but you will see some cases where mRNAs do not span the whole genome. So RNA has to be copied end to end with no loss of sequence. So that's genome replication. And then we have to make mRNAs. Remember, the viruses need to have their mRNAs translated by the cellular translation apparatus. So viral RNAs have to be made that can be utilized by ribosomes. So two requirements for the RNA synthesis activity in cells. All right, so please go to Socrative. What, which statement about negative strand RNA viruses is correct? Number four is winning, but there are quite a few on three and five. So let's explain this. All right, RNA viruses, it's not coated with protein. That's clearly wrong. The negative strand RNA has to be coated with protein because that allows it to be copied into RNA as soon as it gets into a cell. The genome does encode an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And it may have secondary structure, those stem loops that I just showed you. So it's two and three. First one is wrong. The genome is certainly, for negative strand viruses, is always coated with protein. So there are some rules for RNA synthesis that we recognize, and they're shown here. The synthesis initiates and termina terminates at specific sites on a template. We'll see some examples of that. Uh, the initiation may require a primer or may happen what we call de novo without a primer. Uh, and sometimes other viral and cellular proteins are involved in the process. The RNA is made in a template-directed way, although we'll see an example at the very end of some non-template-directed RNA synthesis. Those are the exceptions. Uh, the incorporation of deoxy NTPs occurs in a 5 to 3 prime direction. So synthesis occurs in a 5 to 3 prime direction. And as I said, there's some non-templated RNA synthesis that we recognize as well. So here's some examples of priming. So some RNA polymerases of viruses need a primer and some don't. So the ones that don't are called de novo initiation where basically, so here's the uh, RNA in green. Here's the three prime end, and the first base is simply added by the polymerase that's complementary to that end right there. So that's initiation right at the last base, the polymerase sees it, puts on the first base. And so a lot of the viral polymerases can do this, they don't need a primer. Here's another example of a de novo initiation where uh, the priming is happening not at the end, but somewhere internal. That's, that's a detail you need not worry about. The point is here that you don't need a primer. In contrast, here at the bottom are two examples of primer-dependent initiation. So it's not enough just to have a, a, a nucleotide. The polymerase can't recognize that. It needs to have something attached to the nucleotide or a nucleotide. So there are examples of protein-linked primers. We're going to see an example of that later today. Here, that little orange ball is a protein linked to the first couple of bases, and these are complementary to the template. Uh, and uh, there's some cases where the primer is actually a capped primer. You know, cap is a structure present at the five prime end of mRNAs, and some of the primers for viral RNA is, are, are caps linked to a number of bases. So there's something wrong with this figure. This is not the right color. 
All right, this should be the lighter colored green to, sh to show that it's um, the complementary strand. I know you're not worried about that, but I have to fix this in the next edition of the textbook. All right, so we have a template up here on the upper left, and the polymerase, sometimes it requires a pro yes? Okay, the difference between a protein-linked primer and a capped primer. So a protein is a series of amino acids, right? And this, this is linked to the nucleotides. A cap is not a protein. It is another base, but it's linked to the five prime end in a flipped orientation. Instead of a five to three prime, it's a five to five prime linkage. That's all a cap means, yeah. All right, so we have a template here. The polymerase will read it in a three to five prime direction, but will synthesize in a five to three prime. Um, you always need a three prime hydroxyl. The enzyme has to see that it could be a single NTP bound to the end, or it could be the three prime end of a primer. So here we have a primer uh, complementary to the template, and the next base will be added, of course, based on uh, what's base, what is uh, dictated excuse me, by the template. So here on the right is, is a detailed view of the uh, elongation. Here's our template uh, with uh, four bases here. And there's already base. This is actually a DNA, of course, because you see the T. But the principles are the same for RNA. And we're putting in the next base here. This is this T base pairing with the A. Uh, so again, the template is re read in a three to five prime direction. The next base put in would go right here. But the synthesis is five to three prime. So the, here's the T. Uh, TTP going in here, it's the T in the ribose, and then one, two, three phosphates. And of course, the two the distal, or the, the gamma and the beta phosphates, are going to be uh, released. And then this phosphorus will participate in a diester bond here, as you can see here, phosphodiester bond. The way the uh, addition of the triphosphate occurs is the same for DNA to RNA. It's called the two metal mechanism for catalysis. Uh, there are two aspartates in the polymerases, and we'll see where they are in a moment, that coordinate two magnesium ions, which participate in a series of uh, attacks on the, on the bonds to liberate uh, this uh, phosphorus here so they can participate in the phosphodiester bond. So it's a two-metal catalysis. The two asps, A and C, coordinate these two uh, magnesiums, and that all uh, plays into this uh, attack at the catalytic site. Now, uh, we now know sequences of all four classes of RNA and DNA polymerase, and they're shown here as blue lines. So we have RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which we're talking about today. We have uh, RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, which is reverse transcriptase. We'll talk about that another time. Then we have DNA polymerase, DNA making DNA from DNA, and then we have DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which makes mRNAs. So all four classes of enzymes have been studied in bacteria, archaea, eukaryotes, and they're very similar, and you can see the, the sequences line up, and they have some conserved regions. They're shown by these green uh, bars here, A, uh, B, C, D, and E. Now the RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, uh, this, this motif C is very important. This is part of the active site. You'll see that in a minute. This has a gly-asp-asp motif, so it's found in all post-strand RNA polymerases. The reason I tell you that is because those are the two asp partates that coordinate the magnesium ions in the active site to allow the incoming triphosphate to be incorporated. Uh, this is just asp-asps in reverse transcriptase and the negative strand polymerases of segmented RNA viruses. Uh, in non-segmented negative strand uh, RNA virus polymerases, it's a gly asp acin, and there's another variation. These, these are not important. The important point is there's a conserved sequence uh, in motif C, which is in the active site of all of these enzymes, that's important for coordinating these two metal ions. Uh, you can see that because these have a lot of sequence homology in these green areas, they probably all derive from an ancestral polymerase that was present many, many years ago and then diverged to uh, recognize different kinds of nucleic acid templates. So here's the st crystal structure of poliovirus polymerase. Poliovirus is a plus-stranded uh, RNA virus. This was the first polymerase whose structure was solved. 
And uh, here, it is a typical polymerase in that it looks like a palm, it looks like a hand with a palm domain, a thumb and a fingers domain. And the, the palm contains the active site. And in particular, these, uh, these different conserved domains, A, B, C, and D, are, are color-coded here and labeled like this is the red is the A domain here. And the one I want to point out to you is the C domain. Uh, that's in yellow. These are two beta strands that form the active site of the polymerase. And these two um, side chains that are shown in yellow, those are the two ASP residues, part of the ASP, gliasp ASP, conserved in all these uh, plus stranded polymerases that coordinates the uh, magnesium during the addition. All right, so these, these polymerases are, are closed and the polymerization happens inside uh, and right at this active site. This is a, a, a space filling model of the same polymerase uh, with the front cut away so you can see what's going on in here. Normally, again, this would be closed. There would be a channel here and a channel at the bottom. So what's happening here is the template is shown in blue. It is snaking into the active site. And the active site is marked in, uh, in magenta here. And that little red sphere, which you can just see there, that's one of the two magnesium ions, which is being held in place at one of those aspartates. So that marks the active site. And here is the, uh, here's the product, which is in yellow. So as the template is going through the polymerase, it comes in the bottom and comes out the top, uh, the next bases are added to the product and the product then comes out the bottom. And uh, here is the active site and the next NTP would be added right there. So it gives you an idea of what's going on here. All the polymerases look pretty much like this, the RNA polymerases that we're gonna talk about. There is an active site where triphosphates are added uh, to the product based on the template. One interesting point about this uh, active site, we can actually see from the structure why this enzyme prefers NTPs. It doesn't use deoxy NTPs, right? Those are what the DNA polymerases use. These only incorporate uh, NTPs. If you give them deoxy NTPs, nothing will happen. And this is a picture of UTP. So here is the uridine ring and uh, three phosphates here bound in the active site of the polio polymerase. So this is ready to be added to the growing chain. And this shows you why it, uh, the polymerase only recognizes NTPs. So there is a hydrogen bond formed between ASP-238, which is here in red, and the two prime hydroxyl of the ribose ring. If this were DNA, this would be a proton, H. There would be no oxygen there, so it couldn't form a hydrogen bond. So that's why the DNTPs don't fit in. It's a very simple explanation based on the structure. If you, if you change these polymerases by mutagenesis, you can change this residue and get them to recognize uh, deoxy NTPs. But as it is in these viruses, it takes only NTPs because of this interesting um, uh, hydrogen bonding. And by the way, while we're here, this is the uh, the motif C and the two aspartate residues that coordinate those magnesium ions. So this is the active site uh, of the enzyme. Okay, next question. Which which is a universal rule about RNA-directed RNA synthesis. Number one is getting a lot of votes here, but also number four. 
So let's have a look at that. Number one, RNA dependent RNA polymerase may initiate de novo or require a primer. So de novo means without a primer or with, that's correct. It initiates randomly, now it doesn't initiate randomly. It always initiates at a very specific place uh, on the template. It's not synthesized in a three to five prime. It's copied, the template is read in a three to five prime, but the new product is made five to three prime. Uh, and it's not always template directed. There are some cases of non-template directed uh, RNA synthesis. The non-templated is called RNA editing. We're going to talk about that at the end. I haven't explained it to you yet. All right, so let's look at some examples of plus strand RNA virus replication. What I want to do now is we're moving away from the enzymology and I want to talk about overall schemes, how these genomes are replicated and made into mRNA. So we're going to talk about Picorna and flaviviruses as examples of plus strand RNA, and also another class, uh, alpha viruses. And the picornas and flavies are similar because they take their plus stranded RNA genome, which is messenger RNA, and that can be translated directly. It's replicated through a negative strand intermediate. Very simple, straightforward uh, scheme. In contrast, these alpha viruses, uh, they have a long plus stranded mRNA, which uh, can be translated, but they also make what's called a subgenomic uh, mRNA for, for reasons that nobody really understands. So they can access most of their coding material from this uh, RNA, but as you'll see, they also have to make a subgenomic RNA, and a subgenomic RNA simply means that it's smaller than the viral genome, and they have to do that from a negative strand complement. All right, let's look at the picornas and flavies first. Uh, this is a scheme of replication of the picornaviruses. They bind receptors. Yes? If you have a plus strand um, genome, how does it produce the minus strand genome without an RDRP? So if you have a plus strand genome, how do you make the minus strand without an RDRP? You have to translate the plus strand genome first, okay? That is the key. The plus strand genome can be translated as soon as it comes in the cell. One of the translation products is an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So RNA synthesis of these viruses will not occur until at least one round of translation occurs in the cell. So, and that's shown here. These plus-stranded RNA genomes are put in the cytoplasm, and immediately ribosomes are attracted to them. They are translated into a protein, uh, and this is actually a polyprotein. We'll talk about that later, which is cleaved by viral proteases uh, to make not only the capsid proteins, but also the viral proteins that replicate the genome, including the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So um, among the proteins here, uh, the polymerase takes the plus-stranded RNA and copies it to a minus strand and then back to plus strands. And these plus strands can be translated, they could be shunted into the translation pool, or later in infection they can be packaged into virions. So it's really straightforward, this is probably the most straightforward of all the schemes. Uh, of how this, this genetic information is expressed. So here again is the viral RNA of, of polio. It's a plus-stranded RNA. It has some unusual features, which we'll talk about later. It has, a, instead of a cap at the five prime end, it has a small protein linked to the genome. And it turns out that's there because the primer for RNA synthesis is a protein-linked primer. I'll show you that in a minute. The three prime end is polyadenylated, which is typical of mRNAs. And this, RNA has a long open reading frame, which encodes for one very long protein, something like 250,000 Daltons, and that's chopped up by virus-encoded proteases. There are two proteases embedded uh, in this polyprotein, 3C and 2A, and they process the whole thing. So down here at the very C terminus, here's the RNA polymerase. It's called 3 d Paul, and that's the enzyme that replicates this viral genome. So the viral RNA has a lot of secondary structure in it, and this is all involved in RNA replication. There's a clover leaf at the five prime end. Uh, there is a hairpin, a stem loop structure in the middle. It's called the cis-acting RNA element, or CRE. And then there's a pseudonaut at the three prime end. And all of these structures are why the RNA polymerase of the virus only copies viral RNA and not cellular RNAs. It never copies. Just think of it, you know, in the beginning of infection, the cell is full of mRNAs. The polymerase ignores them, and it's because they don't have uh, these signals, which are essential for being recognized as a template by the polymerase. 
All right, so the first thing that we have to look at is this clover leaf at the five prime end. And I've sh I show you now the sequence of just the clover leaf. The rest of the genome would be attached here where it says three prime end. Uh, and then I'm showing you the very last or the five prime base on the RNA, which is a U. This is a uridine. Uh, and in the genomic RNA, which I just showed you, it's covalently linked to this small protein called VPG. And there is a tyrosine residue, which has a hydroxyl normally, and that's the oxygen from that tyrosine. And it's linked via a phosphodiester bond to the first U residue. So this is a protein nucleotide linkage. And you'll see how it gets there, but the primer for viral RNA synthesis is protein linked. So the primer, the first thing that happens when the RNA polymerase is made and it's getting ready to copy the genomic RNA, it adds two U residues to the VPG. VPG is the small protein which will eventually be on the five prime end of newly synthesized strands. So it stands for virion protein genome linked. It's 22 amino acids long, it's very small. And what happens is two U residues get added to it. So you have VPG UU. And that is the primer for the RNA polymerase that will sit down at the three prime end of the viral RNA and initiate polymerization along with the RNA polymerase. The U's are added by the viral RNA polymerase, which is called 3, 3D. And this addition, it's really interesting. It happens at this Cree element, which is the hairpin structure in the middle of the genome. So apparently, a couple of molecules of polymerase bind this uh, Cree element. VPG comes in, it's held there, and then the loop in this stem loop has a bunch of A residues, which apparently serve as a template for adding these U's to the VPG. All right, so VPG is uridylated. Now it's ready to serve as a primer. The actual initiation step of RNA synthesis is very interesting. It's all membrane bound. It happens on vesicles that are induced during infection. So the vesicles are shown up here. And one of the viral proteins apparently anchors the replication complex. And it's actually a circular, a circular RNA that's formed. So here's the viral RNA circularized. Uh, at the five prime end, the clover leaf binds uh, at one end a cellular protein called PCBP, and at the other side, a molecule of the polymerase. The polymerase, in turn, interacts with poly A binding protein. That's a cellular protein whose function it is to bind poly A sequences. So it binds the poly A at the three prime end of the viral RNA. So now you see this template is circularized. It's very unusual. Here we have the uridylation of VPG happening at the Cree sequence right there at the top. There's VPG UU. Uh, and then when, it's when the polymerase is ready to start copying, this primer is transferred to the three prime end. We don't know how that happens. And now uh, the polymerase begins to copy it. So VPG UU is transferred to the poly A. You can see it hybridizing. It's acting as a primer. Then the polymerase begins to elongate. And eventually you get the synthesis of a negative strand. So the initiation occurs while it's circular. And then uh, as soon as the polymerase begins copying, it opens up into a linear molecule so that it can be copied. So this all happens on membranes, and it turns out that for most RNA viruses, RNA synthesis happens on membranous vesicles that are induced by infection. It doesn't just happen in the cytoplasm floating around. Apparently, it is efficient to put the RNA synthesis machinery on the surface of a membranous vesicle. And in, in polio and picornate infected cells, these are induced by, by infection. Here on the top is an electron micrograph of an uninfected cell. And you see this is a normal cytoplasm with endoplasmic reticulum in Golgi. After about two hours of infection, all the ER in Golgi are gone, and they're replaced with these small vesicles uh, right there and right there and right there. Now these dots are newly assembled virions that have been made, um, but the RNA synthesis occurs on the surface of all of these vesicles. So the cytoplasm is totally rearranged by a couple of viral proteins. All right, next question. Which is a part of the poliovirus replication strategy?
Yes. Yes. Okay, so the question is, during replication, does the RNA lose its secondary structures? We presume so in order to copy it. No one's shown it directly, but there's no other way that the polymerase would be able to copy across the hairpin without melting it out. Yeah. In fact, one of the viral proteins seems to have unwinding activity, which is probably doing that. Yeah. All right, let's see what we have here. A little confusion. All right, number three and four are seeming to be winning. Let us see here. So, uh, which part of the polio replication strategy? So, it's not subgenomic mRNAs. All right, that makes a complete. The, the genome is the mRNA, and the, and the copies of it are full length genome length pieces. Uh, de novo without primer initiation. The primer is protein linked. That's what VPGUU is. That's the primer for RNA synthesis. If we do circularize the template. So uh, the key here is this one. It, we do use a primer, uh, not without a primer. Okay? All right, so that's picornis. Now let's just look at another plus strand RNA virus where it makes subgenomic RNAs. And that's shown over here on the right. And these are. Uh, the so-called Togaviridae synbis, Semliki forest virus, chikungunya virus, which we'll talk about later. These are plus-strand RNA viruses. Um, they're in icosahedral capsids with an envelope on them. All right, so they bind receptors. They're taken into the cell, and then the RNA is put in the cytoplasm. can be translated. It is a plus-stranded RNA, but not the whole genome is translated, only two-thirds or so is translated. And I'll show you a close-up of that in a moment. So you get a number of proteins made, including the RNA polymerase. So the RNA polymerase is made, then that polymerase goes and copies uh, that incoming plus strand into negative strands, and those can be copied again into plus strands, which eventually could go into virions. But it also makes a subgenomic mRNA from the minus strands. And that's shown here. And it's subgenomic because it's not a complete copy, and it's actually uh, a copy of only the three prime third or so of the mRNA. And from that subgenomic RNA, the virus makes structural proteins, including the glycoprotein uh, and the capsid protein. So I cannot tell you why this happens, because it seems to me it would be simpler to make just a single plus strand and translate the whole thing. So that's why humans don't design viruses, I suppose, because they don't know what really works in certain conditions. All right, so here's the viral plus strand RNA. It's polyadenylated. It has a cap. As soon as it gets in the cell, it's translated to make the RNA polymerase, shown up here. But it can only be translated up to this red dot. That's a termination codon. For some reason, there's a termination code on there. And then the rest of the coding sequence, which encodes the structural proteins, can't be accessed anymore because the ribosomes don't get by it. So the RNA polymerase copies the plus strand into a minus strand, uh, and then it makes a subgenomic RNA from that minus strand. There's a promoter right there for initiation. This is a small mRNA that encodes the capsid proteins, the structural proteins, okay? So it's a, it's a plus strand virus, but for some reason it makes a subgenomic uh, RNA. Uh, let's look at negative strand RNA viruses now. We have two kinds. We have kinds with a single RNA, the unimolecular, like VSV, and then we have segmented, like influenza virus, right? So let's look at VSV, the negative strand viruses with a single RNA. Uh, VSV binds receptors, it gets into cells, the RNA gets in the cytoplasm. This RNA is an RNA protein complex. It's coated with N protein and there's a molecule of RNA polymerase on it. So that as soon as it gets in the cell, it can be copied by the RNA polymerase to make RNA. And what the strategy is for this virus is to make one, two, three, four subgenomic mRNAs. So from a single long RNA, it makes four individual subgenomic mRNAs. So it could have made one mRNA and made long protein and processed it, but it, it doesn't. It's got a different approach which worked quite well. And each of those mRNAs are then translated uh, to make more polymerase that can replicate the negative strand through a plus uh, RNA intermediate. 
uh, and then eventually can assemble new virions. This whole assembly business, by the way, I, I'm glossing over because we have an entire lecture on that. We'll cover it later. I just want to focus on the gene expression at this point. So let's look, take a look at how this works in some detail. Remember, the RNA is coiled up helically in the virus, uh, bound to N protein, and there's also a single molecule of polymerase. So when that RNA gets in the cell, it's ready to be copied into these subgenomic mRNAs. You can see them here, and each mRNA is translated to form uh, a single protein. So it's, it's a very simple expression strategy. Subgenomic mRNAs from, each, uh, from, the, from the incoming negative strand. So remember, they're shorter than the negative strand. So I think this starts to illustrate a conundrum that we have with some of these viruses that make subgenomic mRNAs. You have to get into a different mode to replicate the genome. So you can't copy these mRNAs to make a new negative strand because they're all too short. So you have to, at some point in infection, switch from making mRNA to copying the genome and making a full length plus stranded RNA. It's the same enzyme that's doing this. So what regulates it? Well, it turns out that these RNA binding proteins, like the nuclear protein, regulate the switch from mRNA synthesis to plus strand genome RNA, uh, sorry, to plus strand synthesis and eventually to negative strand genome synthesis. You'll see the same happens for influenza virus. So here's our viral RNA negative strand. It's all bound up in the virion with N protein. Yeah, it's, there's a single polymerase bound at the three prime end. As soon as this gets in the cell, the mRNAs are made. The polymerase starts here, it makes an mRNA, it stops, it starts, makes the next one, it stops, it makes the next one, et cetera, et cetera, until they're all made. Uh, and uh, you may start to make the proteins. Then, when the N protein reaches a certain concentration, it's translated uh, from the N mRNA. So the mRNA synthesis happens for a few hours, and then as soon as you get enough N protein, it begins to bind up the plus strand, and that helps it to elongate. It's an anti-terminator, basically. Instead of the polymerase stopping and starting after each mRNA, when in the presence of high concentrations of N, it will now make a full-length plus strand. And then that can be copied by the polymerase to make a negative strand, which is needed to go into new virus particles. All right? So this is a switch. From early on, mRNA synthesis, when you need proteins made, to making full-length plus RNAs, which are the template for negative strands for incorporation into uh, new virions. Right. Uh, this is just a detailed examination of what happens between each of these genes. So here is the, again, the negative strand RNA. I'm just showing you a couple of the genes, N, P, and M. There's an entergenic region between each one. The polymerase, and it's coated with N protein. I haven't shown it here. The polymerase is shown bound at the three prime end. It synthesizes the first mRNA. Then it gets to this intergenic region. There's a termination sequence there. Uh, and then it polyadenylates this mRNA and then goes on to make the next RNA. So it's a sequential series of transcriptions. You make the first one, you stop. You make the second one and stop. And again, all that is antagonized by the N protein as soon as there's enough made. Uh, in each of these intergenic sequences, there's a short stretch of U. So on the left is the upstream gene, on the right is the downstream gene. This is one intergenic sequence. And what happens is when the RNA polymerase, shown here as the oval, uh, when it reaches this intergenic sequence, there's a termination signal there, it stops, but then it starts to stutter at this short stretch of U's. It just sits there and starts to crank out A residues, which are the complement. And it gets to about 200, and then it says, it's enough of this, I'm not getting anywhere. And it drops the message, and it goes on to the next gene. But the result is that this mRNA is polyadenylated. All right, so the, the polyadenylation is, is directed by a short U stretch. The polymerase is sitting there, terminated, and it's just stuttering, we call it. It makes lots of uh, A's as a consequence. So the, the RNA doesn't encode 200. A residues, but rather this is made by a stuttering mechanism. Now that's viruses with a single long negative strand RNA. You remember that influenza virus has negative stranded RNA genome, but it's in pieces. There are eight segments. And basically each of these eight segments is copied in a way that I just showed you for VSV. But I want to show you a couple of interesting uh, 
differences. So don't be scared by this. Uh, all you have to remember is that the virus is taken into the cell. We talked about endocytosis. Uh, the RNPs are liberated as the pH drops and the membranes fuse. And these actually go into the nucleus. This is one of the few RNA viruses that needs to get in the nucleus in order to replicate its RNA. The, RNA, the negative strand RNA gets in the nucleus, uh, and then mRNAs are made. These, these encode proteins, uh, so the mRNAs are shipped out into the cytoplasm. Uh, they're translated into a variety of proteins, which you need not worry about at this point. And then at some point, uh, the synthesis switches to full-length plus strands, which are then copied to minus strands. So again, the key here is that these mRNAs, just like for VSV, are not complete copies of the negative-stranded genome. They fall short. So at some point, you have to switch between mRNA synthesis and full-length plus strand synthesis. Yeah? So there are, there's no reason to make a subgenomic negative strand RNA. The question is there is no reason to make subgenomic negative strand, right. If you made a subgenomic negative strand, that would be a mistake because that wouldn't be the whole genome, right? You wouldn't want to package that. The only reason for the, the full-length um, plus strand RNA in this case is just for the replication purposes. Absolutely. The only reason for the plus strand, full-length plus strand, is to make a full-length minus strand. And it was the same for VSV. That full-length plus strand that was made doesn't have any function except to serve as a template for, for minus strands. Yes? Yes. So when I say full length, what I mean, it's, it's a complete copy of either the segment in this case or for VSV, the whole genome, the whole genome or the whole segment. Okay. All right. So let's see how this happens. All right. So the virus has eight negative strand RNAs in it. Each of them is bound up to a nuclear protein and a polymerase molecule. And you can see them here. Uh, it's also shown schematically here. It's got a helical form. It's not double-stranded, but it's, it's base-paired along its length. Uh, and there are proteins bound to the RNA and, uh, and also a molecule of polymerase. So here are each of the eight RNAs, negative-stranded RNAs. As they come in the cell, they're copied into mRNAs. Sorry, these are negative-strand RNAs. As they enter the cell, they're copied into individual mRNAs, you can see here. Again, the mRNAs are not full-length copies of each negative segment. I think that'll be clear in the next slide. Each of these mRNAs codes for at least one protein. Some of them encode two proteins. So here, for example, this first segment encodes two proteins. Most of them encode one. And then the last two here encode two proteins because they're actually spliced to give rise to a different mRNA that encodes a different protein. And we'll talk about the function of those proteins later on. But you can see uh, here is the M2 ion channel, which was important during entry. Uh, the M1 is a structural protein, et cetera. All right, let's look at how this happens. So let's focus on one segment. This happens for all eight. We'll just focus on one. Uh, here's the negative strand RNA as it's in the virion. It's coated with protein and it has a polymerase molecule. Again, that's shown schematically here. Uh, the RNA here on the right is shown in red. And the little circles are the N protein or NP protein, and here's the polymerase in blue. As soon as this comes in the cell, the enzyme copies it and makes an mRNA. Two very interesting aspects of this. First, it's, it's not a complete copy. The mRNA is not a complete, sorry, it's at the top. The mRNA is not a complete copy of the genome. You see it falls short. It terminates about 20 nucleotides from the end. Okay, so just like VSV, it's not, the mRNA is not a full copy of the negative strand genome. But when it's primed, it needs a capped primer. And this is basically a host mRNA that has been cut by a viral enzyme to provide a capped primer. This is about uh, 12 to 13 nucleotides long. And this primes mRNA synthesis. Uh, on the negative strand. So every influenza virus RNA has some random sequence at its very far prime end, which is derived from the primer. It's like 10 or 12 nucleotides. You'll see how that happens in a moment. So cap primer and short of the three prime end of the five prime end of the negative strand RNA. So again, we need to make a full length plus strand to serve as a template to get 
more minus strands, and that's going to be the only function of that full-length plus strand. How do we do it again by the NP protein? Uh, early in infection, you make lots of mRNAs. They're translated into proteins. As the NP protein concentration rises, it begins to bind to the mRNAs that are initiated and eventually uh, anti-terminates and allows the synthesis of full-length plus strands. These are not primed with capped primers. They're just initiated with an A. So it's really interesting. The same enzyme is either cap primer dependent or primer independent, depending on what it's doing. Yes? Uh, you say the viral protein cleaves the host uh, protein that creates the cap. Right. So when is that, uh, that protein that cleaves synthesized? So that is an endonuclease. And I think we have in the next slide, an illustration. It's an endonuclease, which is part of the polymerase complex of the virus. And that's one of the reasons why this RNA has to be in the nucleus, because it grabs newly synthesized host mRNAs, and then it cleaves them. All right, so you make a full-length plus strand, and then that's copied into full-length negative strands, which will eventually be packaged into new virions. So again, the NP is a key protein in getting full-length plus strands made instead of mRNAs. It's a key for the switch. Yeah? Is it just because it uh, cuts the primer that allows the... Yeah, what... Is it just because the NP cuts the primer that allows the translation of the entire... No, so the question is, is it because the NP cuts the primer that uh, allows full-length synthesis? No, in fact, these molecules are not initiated with this primer at all. It's, it's just initiated with an A. And uh, the NP simply is binding the, the product as it elongates and, and prevents it from terminating early down here. And it's sort of an anti-terminator protein that allows synthesis of the full-length plus strands. It has nothing to do with cleaving the primer. So because it binds in different segments, it doesn't allow the synthesis to terminate? That's right. Because the NP is binding along the whole length, it doesn't allow uh, termination here. It makes it go to the very end. Um, and then the, the negative strands, of course, are packaged. So let's look, at the, let's look at the primer. So they said the primer is a cellular message cap and about 10 to 12 nucleotides. So here's a cellular message. Here's a cap structure and then some random sequence. And the viral polymerase, one of the subunits, is an endonuclease. It simply cleaves here. Uh, and then it always seems to cleave at a, at a G or something that can base pair with... Uh, the negative strand RNA of the virion at the three prime end. So now this is the primer used by the polymerase. Uh, the G is going to base pair here, and then you get incorporation uh, of the of the rest of the plus strand. So here again is the the final mRNA is capped. It has some host sequences, uh, and then the virus has uh, polymerized the, the plus strand onto the negative strand template. Okay, so the primer is a capped fragment derived from host cell mRNAs, and all this happens in the nucleus. And the last step is polyadenylation, which is also very similar to what happens for VSV. There's a short stretch of U residues at the end of the minus strand, and the polymerase stutters on that. So this is the actual polymerase complex. There are three proteins. Um, there's an RNA polymerase, there's the endonuclease that cleaves host cell mRNAs. And what we're showing here is a virion RNA which is bound to the polymerase. The 5' prime end is locked up here. Uh, and then this is the active site down at the bottom in red. And the idea is that instead of the polymerase moving along this RNA, the idea is that the RNA is pulled through the polymerase. So imagine someone holding the 3' prime end and pulling it through the active site. And as it moves past the active site, the mRNA is made. Now, eventually, you're going to get a to a point where you can't pull anymore because the 5' prime end is locked down in the polymerase, and there just so happens to be a stretch of U at that point, and the polymerase starts cranking out A's, just as it did for VSV. And eventually, after 200 or so, it stops, and the message is released. So again, polyadenylation by slippage or stuttering at a short U sequence. All right, time for a question. All right, how are influenza virus and VSV RNA synthesis similar? 
tried to point that out to you, as I've told you. Number four is winning. Let's see what we have there. And that's right, they're all correct. The switch from mRNA to genome synthesis is controlled by an RNA binding protein, the N or the NP protein. Polydenylation occurs at a short stretch of view, that's correct, by this stuttering mechanism. And viral mRNAs are shorter than the minus genome RNA. That's the case for both VSV and influenza. They're, they fall short of the genome. Very much so, so for VSV, where the mRNAs are tiny compared to the genome. And it's more subtle, about 20 bases for flu. All right, the last set of viruses I want to walk you through are double-stranded RNA viruses. Their genome has a plus and a minus strand. These are real viruses. The plus strand is capped, but it can't be translated because the ribosomes can't get to it. So these viruses have a molecule of RNA polymerase bound to each double-stranded RNA in the virion. And that, uh, double st that polymerase takes this template and makes an mRNA from it. So it copies the, th the negative strand, makes an mRNA, and that's translated into protein. Uh, and then when, the vir when new virions are made, a subset of these mRNAs, they look exactly the same. There's no difference in sequence. They're full-length copies. Uh, these are simply made double-stranded by the polymerase. So the mRNA is copied to make a minus strand. And these are genome RNAs. They're packaged into new virions. All right? The, the neat thing about this is that a good deal of all the enzymology, all the RNA synthesis happens in a virus or a subviral particle. Let me show you what I mean. So here are real viruses, double-stranded RNAs, uh, a number of segments, each encodes a single mRNA, as you can see at the bottom, which encodes uh, some proteins, one or two proteins. Um, start here. This is a very complicated slide, and I, don't, I want you to ignore most of it. Uh, let's start uh, with infection here. This is the native particle. It gets taken up into the cell by endocytosis, and this virus is unusual. Most of the viruses I've told you about that are taken up by endocytosis, they escape the endosome before the lysosome fuses. So as a normal part of the endocytic pathway, lysosomes fuse with the endosome and they deliver you know, proteolytic enzymes, nucleases, and so forth. It's a normal part of the cell cycle. The, most viruses get out because they don't want to be degraded, but this virus stays in. It wants those proteolytic enzymes to take off the outer shell of the capsid and eventually, when that outer shell is taken off, this particle that results is very hydrophobic. That's one here. It can p penetrate right out of the endosome into the cytoplasm. So now this is a particle still with, with double-stranded segments in it, and each segment is attached to a polymerase. It begins to make messenger RNA, and those mRNAs come out of each five-fold axis of symmetry. There's a turret with a hole in it through which the mRNAs come out. You can see that happening here. Uh, those mRNAs can be translated into proteins, and the proteins can assemble uh, new subviral particles. That's a bunch of mRNAs with protein around it. In that is also a molecule of polymerase, and that polymerase will eventually uh, make the RNAs double-stranded, and then outer capsid proteins will be added in the virion matures. So, this, this mRNA synthesis never happens in the cytoplasm. The initial mRNAs are made in the incoming virion. They're put out in the cytoplasm. They're translated and immediately assembled into subviral particles. The mRNAs are made double-stranded and then mature. So this is a neat, a neat twist on RNA synthesis. There's nothing fancy about subgenomic mRNAs or anything like that, but it's kind of interesting that this happens in the particle. And this is a picture of this happening. This is a cryo-EM of, uh, of a real virus. And at each five-fold axis of symmetry, there is this turret structure. And here you can see a molecule of RNA. This is a messenger RNA being made by a polymerase, which is right below 
the fivefold uh, axis, and the mRNA is coming out into the cytoplasm. It's a pretty neat um, mechanism. All right, so the last bit I want to tell you about is how RNA synthesis can be a source of diversity. And this is going to be really important when we talk about evolution later on in this course. And I want to tell you about mutation as a source. I want to tell you about recombination and RNA editing, three distinct mechanisms. So these polymerases that I've told you about make mistakes. In fact, every polymerase that we know of makes mistakes. The RNA-dependent RNA polymerases don't have any way to, make, to correct their mistakes. They don't have a proofreading activity like DNA polymerases do. So they have a high error frequency, one misincorporation per 1,000 to 10,000 nucleotides polymerized. So in any genome of 10,000 bases, every time it replicates, there could be between uh, 1 and 10 mutations. So that's actually good, that variation. That's what is used to evolve viruses to adapt to different environments and so forth. This, this um, infidelity, all right, the ability to make mistakes, is, has actually been selected for during evolution. Because you can make a single amino acid change in the poliovirus RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which makes it make less errors. Okay, you can improve the fidelity, and that, that virus can't compete. If you put it head-to-head -head with a wild-type virus in cells or in an animal, it absolutely loses every time because it can't make enough mutants to compete uh, in, during replication. It's kind of a weird thought, I suppose, but the mutation that makes it more, less error-prone makes it less fit and able to compete. And it shows you that mutation, high mutation rates have actually been maintained in evolution because there are ways that these enzymes could be uh, making fewer mistakes, but they, they are not maintained in evolution. And this goes not only for these viral polymerases, but cellular polymerases as well. DNA polymerases make fewer errors because they have a proofreading activity, but they still make errors, and you can improve that, and even then the <coughs> DNA viruses are, aren't able to compete as well. All right, so that's one source of diversity. During this process that I've told you, this really nice process of making mRNAs and genomes, you make mistakes. And those mistakes, you'll see later, give rise to new viruses. The second is recombination. You will know probably that DNA can recombine by crossing over in cells, but RNA can recombine also. And this happens during polymerization. So here we have a template at the top in blue, and we have an RNA polymerase, uh, this, this uh, oval structure here which is copying uh, the three prime end. Uh, I'm sorry, the template is, is the green one at the bottom, and the polymerase is copying it to make the lighter green complement. Uh, in cells, there are lots of RNA molecules on the surfaces of these vesicles that I told you about, which are sites of RNA synthesis. So what happens is the polymerase is confused and suddenly starts to copy uh, another template. And so the resulting molecule is a hybrid of the two initial uh, templates. We call the bottom one a donor and an acceptor. But you can see it's basically the enzyme moving from one template to another. So this gives rise to recombinants in many different viral systems, uh, poliovirus, uh, and many others as well. And they have consequences, as you'll see later. And, and the last source of diversity is what we call RNA editing. And this is a non-templated form of RNA synthesis. So, so far I've told you how an RNA polymerase here, this is the VSVG, or this is actually a paramyxovirus genome, which looks very much like VSV. It's a negative strand RNA coated with N protein. Polymerase comes in and makes a copy of it. It reads the template and adds bases to the product depending on what's in the template. But every now and then extra bases are added, which are not templated. The enzyme just puts them in. It says, you know, I'm going to stick in an extra A or a U here. So that's called RNA editing. It happens in this gene of uh, these paramyxoviruses like measles and mumps. All right, so the key is it's non-templated. There's not a, a base in the template which is directing its incorporation. The polymerase is deciding on its own to add it. So how does this work? All right, so here is a negative strand RNA, a short sequence 
on the top left. And at the bottom is a mRNA which is being made by the polymerase. So in this case, the mRNA is a faithful copy of the template. So every base in the message is templated. Now look at the next uh, on the bottom here. Here, the polymerase has gone along and copied, but then it's the template slipped back one base uh, and the polymerase added an extra G here and then it resumed here. So there's no template for that G, right? Between the U and the C, there's not an extra G, uh, there's not an extra C. So this is an extra non-templated G. And then the polymerase resumes as normal. So the resulting mRNA has an extra G. So that's what we call by RNA editing. It's non-templated. And here's an example on the upper right of what it does. It can change the reading frame. So here um, is the mRNA with the editing site. Without the edit, without the extra base, you have this protein made here in purple. When you add the extra base, it introduces a terminator slightly downstream. So you make a shorter protein, which, has, which can have a different function. So this happens quite a bit in the viral world. It also happens in eukaryotic organisms as well. Another way for making diversity, yes? Where is that G um, bound to? Like how is it even there? Because if it's in between those two, the rest of the chain would be recognized, right? So basically, the polymerase got here, made a G, and then the template slipped back so that the G bulged out. The product slipped back so the G bulged out and then it added a second G here. So you, could add, you would add one and then slip back and add another. And usually there are stem loop structures that the polymerase is bumping into and causing this, which are not shown here. All right, so there is one very interesting example of, of what editing can do for a virus. This is RNA editing for the Ebola virus glycoprotein mRNA. So the glycoprotein is the protein and bound in the virion envelope, of course. It's shown there. Uh, here is the glycoprotein gene. There's an editing site in the middle of it. The unedited mRNA, that is, so these genomes are negative strand. The mRNA that's a faithful copy of the uh, glycoprotein gene is a secreted protein. It's not bound in the viral membrane. The editing is needed to make a membrane-bound glycoprotein because the editing allows the protein to get a little bit longer and have a transmembrane sequence. So here, the editing is absolutely essential for making the virus able to infect cells. Without editing, it wouldn't have a glycoprotein and it wouldn't be able to infect. It turns out that all these editing sites are important for the virus. This just happens to be a very striking example of how uh, editing can change the function of a protein. All right, our last question for today. Which of the following does not contribute to diversity during RNA synthesis? does not contribute. Okay, so most of you got number one, which is the right answer. A few of you got number four. So number one is proofreading. Of course, proofreading doesn't contribute because it makes it more uh, without errors. Recombination contributes and non-contemplated RNA synthesis contributes and the low fidelity contributes. So the only one that is not contributing is number one. All right.